The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, escape from an African city and anarchy with the help of a few friends, such as Comrade Kalishnikov, Mr. RPG, Ms. Ithaca 37, and Mr. Browning. Also, a tale of heroism and sorrow in the space program, miles and miles of Barayar and conversation, and part 26 of the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. Coming up, we have the second part of a two-part interview with Lois McMaster Bujold, creator of the Vorkosigan Saga and author of a new entry in that series, Captain Vorpatrol's Alliance. Captain Vorpatrol's Alliance was a New York Times bestseller in hardcover and is now out in trade paperback and at booksellers everywhere. Lois talks to us about the great characters from the series, such as Miles Vorkosigan, Ivan Vorpatrol, and fills in details of her own development into a multiple award-winning, multiple best-selling writer. And, of course, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. But first, Bain Associate Editor Laura Haywood Corey joins me for the news. September 15th, that's 2013 for those of you who are listening to this podcast in the future, we'll have our new monthly free fiction and nonfiction up at Bain.com. Excellent. What do we have this month? Well, to support Larry Correa and Mike Kupari's new military adventure novel, Swords of Exodus, we have a brand new story from Larry called Swayothi City. Ooh, an all-new Larry Correa story? Monster Hunter Nation will be happy about that. Yeah, this one is set within the world of Larry and Mike's two novels, Dead Six and Swords of Exodus, uh, those military adventure novels. And man, is it action-packed and hard-hitting. It's about a mercenary fighting his way out of a very bad situation in a very dangerous city in the midst of the overthrow of an African government. Wow. Well, I bet Larry gets all the weapons right. He's quite the gun nerd. Yeah, he does. And, um, oh, Swords of Exodus will be out in, uh, in October, by the way. That's, it's going to be a mass market original, which we sometimes do. Mass market being those, uh, regular paperback size books. Oh, yeah, and we get a glimpse into the backstory of one of the two major characters in Swords of Exodus. Plus, there's action galore. Larry Correa can write an action scene like nobody's business. It's a, it's a really good story. Sounds exciting. So what's the nonfiction this month? Well, we have really an amazing piece. This one is by a former NASA mission specialist and freelance aerospace reporter, Terry Burleson. I'm really proud of this one, Laura. I met Terry at a science fiction convention up in Seattle, and I had the good sense to ask him to write for us at Bain.com. Excellent. So what's the article about? It's, uh, it's, re- it's a meticulously reported look at the first victims of the space shuttle Columbia. You know, Columbia exploded, but this is way back in the 80s. When Columbia was first being test-fired and burned in, there was a terrible accident involving a gas leak at the launch pad, and some of the launch pad crew members were killed, and some others heroically came to their rescue, and they were disabled for life. And Terry follows up on what happened to those people and their families, and he gives all the details of the accident itself, how it happened. It's just, it's an undersung story, underreported story, and it's just fascinating. It's moving stuff, all carefully sourced, and with lots of illustrations and photos. I think it's a really great piece. Sounds like it. I had no idea about uh, about that previous history of Columbia, so I'll be looking forward to reading it. And those are both available on the Bain.com main page starting September 15th, right? Yeah, and and they'll also be available long term in the free ebook form at uh, BainEbooks.com. You can go there and just uh, go to BainEbooks.com and just put in the search words "free nonfiction" and that'll pop up all of our nonfiction anthologies from from the website. And you can download it and read it on your ebook device. And the free f- fiction is also available in ebook form, isn't it? Yeah, you can get that at bainebooks.com too. Put in the search term free f- short stories and that will show you our anthology of the year's free fiction. But really check both of these out on the main page of the regular bain.com website first, um, starting September 15, 2013. It's a banner month for our website content, I do believe, and it's all at bain.com. 
And now Bain Editor Emeritus Hank Davis joins me for part two of an interview with best-selling author Lois McMaster Bujol. I mean, you've developed my uh, Ivan throughout the other uh, Vorkosigan books. I believe there's uh, even viewpoints that you've written in Miles' uh, character. Well, Ivan was a Ivan was a very I'm sorry, Ivan. Teenager, as yeah. teenagers tend to be. Um, but you know, he grew up. He got better. Uh, we we see him in uh, Brothers in Arms as a as a very young officer. We see him also in Sidaganda um, as a young officer. So sort of slowly uh, pulling his act together. Uh, we find out more about him. We find out more backstory. We see him in action. Uh, he's a guy who wants to follow the rules because that way you don't get into trouble, which is like <laughs> matching him with Miles is the worst thing I could do to Ivan. Um, so, uh, so he, he was a fun. He was a fun character, and, and he was, um, I think, a little underappreciated. We see him in uh, Memory and in uh, in uh, Mirror Dance, Mirror Dance, and in Memory. As opposite order and uh, sort of developing once again, becoming more complex, getting older. Uh, and then we see him in uh, first time he got the viewpoint was in a civil campaign, which is a sort of late series book. Uh, and we got to see inside his head where we find out that uh, Ivan does not have hidden depths. Ivan had hidden shallows, <laughs> but uh, but you know, still it's what you see. It's kind of what you see is what you get, guy, which is. Very unlike Miles. Well, why did you decide that he needed his own book? Um, well, a lot of people have been asking for it for a long time, and as usual, I ignored them. And then one day, the idea sort of dropped into my brain. Oh, I can give Ivan this situation. Aha, this is perfect. You know, sort of like the right plot for the character appeared. And all of a sudden, he had something to do uh, with this situation with uh, Tej Arqua. So, oh, yeah, let's give him... Let's give him a girlfriend who's a mafia princess. Let's see, let's see what, he, what he does with that. Uh, and it actually worked out quite well. Yeah, the... And I wanted to, uh, you know, after having done a lot of Miles, Miles is kind of exhausting to write. Uh, writing a, a more laid-back uh, character in my more laid-back, uh, you know, early 60s here, <laughs> where I am much less ambitious than I used to be, was... Uh, was pleasurable. Give him his say in his day. But it's not a. I mean, I would not call this. A, it, it's a, Captain Vorpatrol is Ivan, by the way, in the title. Mm, yeah, Ivan um, Vorpatrol. He's. Uh, I mean, the book itself has. A, I mean, it's not a. It's a light comedy, comedic book. It's not a comedy. Um, it, it's it's sort of a romantic comedy, a comedy of manners, perhaps. Um, but uh, I mean. There's everything that you would find in any other Vorkosigan book in there, I guess. Because... <laughs> oh, yeah. Lots of complications. Lots of people running around tearing yeah. their hair. But, but also a lot of depth to the... I mean, Ivan comes across as a very winning character in this, in this book. He was, he was fun to write. He's fun to write, particularly after Miles, because he's so opposite to Miles. You know? Miles' idea of a problem is to run out and solve it, and Ivan's idea is to sit down and wait and see if it solves itself first. Wait a good long time. So one of the things I found when uh, when trying to inflict a plot on Ivan then is that I pretty much had to have everybody, every other character bring the plot to him. It's very seldom would he actually go actively looking for it. Uh, but this worked out if you have a sufficient cast of, of other active characters. And so his problem is not uh, is having things dropped on his head and then having to to uh, to deal with them. And he he does. He rises to the occasion. That's one of his uh, his many uh, virtues. Is that, uh, you know, he comes through. He seems like the kind of guy that um, that needs uh, bad things to happen so that he can show his greatness. Mm, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> there's um. I was writing it as a romantic comedy, so there were tone limitations on what I could do in terms of the plot. You know, I had some. Some ideas for various kinds of backstory that were interesting, but they they did not belong in this story. They needed some other story of their own. Yeah, people escape death that in 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 interesting ways in the book. I I got the feeling you didn't really want to kill anybody gruesomely. No, I you know, I've kind of done that. The other thing about my books is that I don't like to repeat myself, which was much less of a problem early in my career than now when I have twenty five books behind me. <laughs> what haven't I done? Well. Or... You know, um, so so there's that as well. Now, there were times when I was reading it that it really felt very much like a 19th century novel, maybe a, a, a late Victorian novel. 
And, but they're flying around in spaceships, and there's a girl who's blue, of course. Um, <laughs> but I can real, I can clearly see a Dorothy Sayers influence, maybe Georgette Heyer, maybe even Jane Austen. Um, a little of that, yeah. What can you tell us a little bit about your influences? Uh, romance, the uh, romance author that I had been reading uh, at the time, and uh, thinking about in addition to Heyer, because I'd already done Heyer with the Civil Campaign um, and Shakespeare. Uh, was uh, Jane Ann Krentz, who is a very uneven writer, but very prolific. So she's got some good things out there. She has some interesting formulas. So I sort of started off with the idea of playing with a, with a, a, a Krentz-type romance plot. And it mutated. It uh, sort of wiggled away from that template pretty quickly. And I found that was, was not useful. But it did as a start point. It worked as a start point. Uh, the idea of... Uh, each of the uh, each of the protagonists having a best friend, or at least a friend they could talk to, was extremely useful. Uh, Ivan and Byerly and uh, Tej and Rish uh, both uh, both worked very well as foils and reflectors of each other. Uh, so that uh, so there, you, you take you take ideas from other writers and other things a la carte, and very seldom do you ever take anything wholesale. You take a bit here and a bit there, and you recombine them and turn them into something else, you know, sort of like genetics where the chromosomes are madly swapping genes all over the place uh, to get you know, a new individual at the end or a new book. Well, in, uh, in Captain Vorpatrol's Alliance, um, let's get, uh, talk about the story a little bit. Tej and her sister and companion, Rish, uh, who's, who's blue, are running from some criminal syndicate baddies. Um, you've, you've alluded this sort of, they're from an extreme libertarian planet called Jackson's Hole, Hole with a W. Um, and there's the main love story, but there's also a lot at stake politically here um, in the book. Can you give us the political setup and the stakes for Barriar and the... This is sort of describing the background of the Vercosaverse. We have visited Jackson's Hole before with some of Miles's covert ops operations. And so the, the series reader will know a little bit about it. It's a, it's a planet without a government. Uh, it is uh, run by, you know, formerly criminal syndicates who are sort of senescing into being little, little governments. They're sort of gradually, there's a kind of creeping tide of integrity overtaking Jackson's Hole. They're resisting it, but, you know, there you go. It's what works because they're very pragmatic. And, uh, Tesh's family, we find out this is one of this is a spoiler for uh, the first part of the book, is uh, from one of these syndicates uh, that uh, that is very powerful in Jackson's Hole, but you know not you know not a deal from Barrier's point of view. Jackson's Hole is too disunited to be a potential threat the way C. De Gambe is. You know, they're not going to invade you because they can't get it together. Um, so, uh, but nevertheless, as a as a polity. It's the kind of place where everybody comes to get the things they can't get elsewhere. Uh, there's a lot of uh, espionage going along. There's, you know, it's it's a nexus point. Uh, it's one of the places where Cedigandan buffer influence and barrier and buffer influence almost come up against each other. So, uh, you know, both Cedigandan and barrier are operating there. Uh, the way the Soviet Union and the United States were operating in third world countries. Uh, so there's there's that kind of political background. Yeah, and the Cedigandans are these these genetic sculptors that just the series go... bad guys only much more complex than that because they turn out to be very genetically interesting. They are they are working on becoming the post human race, but it's uh, it's considered a project in progress. It's not considered a prog- uh, project that's finished. If they ever decide they're finished, then watch out because <laughs> they're going to be even more <laughs> dangerous. But uh, but they're they're interesting. We've explored them uh, in detail in the book Seed Aganda you know, earlier in the series. So once again, the series reader will have some background that the new reader will only only get sketched in. One of the problems with writing a late series book like Captain Vorpetro's Alliance is this tremendous amount of backstory that one has developed uh, in detail in the prior books, you know, which may or may not be pertinent to the story at hand. And how do you, you know, how do you bring this in if it's pertinent, without boring the old reader who's had it all before, or confusing the new reader who, you know, who's never heard of this before, and you know, who is at sea when you bring it? See it again. It's what? What are they? You know, so you have to find ways of kind of like cluing in the new reader without boring the old reader. Uh, one of the ways is to uh, 
give the same story from a different viewpoint, you know. So, <clears throat> so the history of Barrier we see from Tej's or a Jacksonian viewpoint. So we get the history of Barrier, but we see it from a viewpoint that the old readers haven't seen before. So there are a lot of little tricks like that. Um, Tej also is new to the planet Barrier, so everything has to be explained to her. And as it is explained to her, it is also explained to the new reader. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so I kind of pull in, I pull in all the tricks that there are you know, to, to do this, because it was a huge amount of backstory that was pertinent. But it, uh, you worked it in seamlessly. I mean... Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you know, I've, I've, I've seen reviews where you know, brand new readers have read this and said it was fine. You know, I, I could follow the story just fine. You know, obviously there's more, but, you know, and by the way, where's book one? Uh, but they, but they had obviously had satisfactory reads. Then the old readers who read it tend to say, "Oh no, you have to read these other fifteen books first, you know, <laughs> to understand this," which is kind of true. But when that new reader goes back and arrives at Captain Vorpetro's Alliance for the second time, it'll be like a whole new book. You know? So they get two books for the price of one, which I think is a good deal. Uh, excellent deal. Yeah. They can buy it in the hardcover and then in the. Trade, trade paperback. <laughs> in, the, in the trade paperback, which is just coming out uh, very soon here. Yes. It'll, by the time we're, we're uh, posted, it'll be out. Go ahead. Uh, the, the trade paperback reverses the covers of the hardcover, so yes. collectors yeah. must have both. Mm-hmm. Well, let's talk about Rish uh, Lapis Lazuli for a bit. She's genetically engineered, um, and she's made to be a dancer by in her genes. She's got and she's colored blue. Um, and there's she's a set of what her mother figure, the Baroness, uh, calls the jewels. Mm-hmm. And she's made to be loyal too. She's genetically coded for it. But she's also, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong with this relationship. But she's Tedge's sister or, or stepsister. Yes, yeah. uh, more or less. It's. When you start messing with genetics and everybody comes out of a uterine replicator, you know, the, the old definitions of siblinghood have to be reexamined, but effectively she's a sister. But she, I mean, in some ways she's, she's been made into a genetic slave. She's been made into this dancing, uh, made to be and a part of... Said that- the seat again that's in the Jacksonians were nice people. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I just, I mean, uh, and uh, every time we... Uh, Every time we run into her, um, I just felt like she, I felt that justice was not being done, that she was just as good as Ted she, as far as being an heir apparent. Why, why didn't her dad... Uh, certainly, certainly as good as, as Star and whatever the other one was, you, know? yeah. <laughs> you wonder. Well, she's mainly interested in dancing at this point. Uh, who knows what will happen in, in her future? Uh, but she is kind of uh, obligately connected with her fellow jewels, the other the other five dancers. Uh, so they come as a group. You know, they're not really happy apart. They're kind so of a... An effect. Yeah. But yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the things about every one of my books is they could spawn a dozen sequels as you follow off these interesting characters that have come up. But, you know, what happens to Rish? What happens to this character or that character? You know, um, it could go on and on, uh, and if I if I could clone myself, I could write all those stories. But mm. the last, well, Rish Rish is a dancer. Um, she's kind of bred to be an artist and esthete, and to have this finely developed uh, taste. Um, there's this great scene where Rish and the other jewels, uh, a dancing troupe that is belongs to a, a royal family, not, not a royal family, but a but a ruling family of Jackson Hole. A mafia family. A mafia family, yes. <laughs> they they perform this uh, complex dance, and they're also making a geophysical survey while they're doing it. But uh, in, in any case, uh, I get the feeling you really enjoy writing uh, that dance, and, and I saw another one in, um, like, Diplomatic Immunity, where, where you have the, the Quaddies dance as well. Mm-hmm. It, is that something you particularly enjoy put I, I just see all these dance uh scenes coming into uh, into your books do you enjoy writing those particular yeah i think art art is a very important part of human culture it's part of human competition um uh, it's it's a big thing for all of us i mean here we are you know talking about art written art um Bain books is all about that uh so you know so it should be it should be part of any well-built world. Uh, nonetheless, you know, having scenes where characters sit down and read books is going to be kind of dull for people who are reading books to get, you know, action and adventure. Uh, so the thing about dance is it's it's visual, it's 
physical. It's you know, it's fun to describe. You know, it's an art that uh, that I can convey. Uh, music is trickier. It's very hard to write about music alone, um, particularly if you're as unmusical as I am. Uh, we have a cattering with a gardening art. Uh, I am not a gardener, so I have to kind of fake it there. But uh, usually I'm looking at dance from the outside, from the point of view of the audience. Uh, in the case of, uh, in both these cases, uh, we see dance uh, through the viewpoint of a non-dancer. The Quadis were particularly fun because they are a genetically engineered race of people who were originally bred to work in free fall. They have a second set of arms in place of legs. So they are dancers with no legs or feet. Uh, and so how do they dance? They dance in free fall and they dance magnificently. But it kind of twists the whole idea of what is dance uh, around. It's, it's one of the fun things you can do with science fiction. And, and the jewels, you know, I, I got uh, had a lot of fun with that too. I got the idea, speaking of picking out things a la carte, there was a Japanese movie about Onmyoji, which had a scene where uh, where the magician dances open the gate of heaven. And uh, and that stuck in my mind for, for my dancers, that, uh, that they would do something that would, you know, open a gate or solve a problem or, or something. I had two or three different ideas before I finally came up with uh, the one that kind of works symbolically here uh, with their, they their were, mapping uh, dance. They were completely, they, I mean, they were further, furthering the plot even as they were dancing. There was two or three things going on at once mm -hmm. in that. So, in that so I got a twofer out of that. That's always great <laughs> when you can get, you know, get your scenes to do more than one thing. Um, because it, it adds to the energy, energy density of the book. Well, there's a wonderful, let's get back to Ivan and Tedge. There's a wonderful progression of Ivan and Tedge's relationship throughout the book as it, yeah. it slowly dawns on them that they might actually be in love. Um, and there's a massive amount of meeting of the various in-laws. And these scenes, they're, they're really delightful. Uh, and it's the heart of the book. And it's a lot of it's about marriage. You're examining it from all sorts of angles. Uh, it's, I mean, it comes across as a very serious thing to enter into or to dissolve because it has so much to do with, with your community, with your uh, culture mm -hmm. that you're about. Um, the communities, yeah. Is Ivan an individual who's finally been caught in this social web that he's been trying to avoid all his life? Or? <laughs> it certainly is. I think he's, he's started to run slower in recent years, <laughs> as one tends to do. Um, well, he's in his mid-30s in the book. It's, it's kind of it's time for him to like move on to the next stage of his life, and many people have been pointing this out to him for a while. So it's not like he doesn't know. Uh, so, but you know, but the right thing has not you know has never happened, and then all of a sudden, because he's Ivan, it dropped into his lap out of the blue. Uh, one of Ivan's several qualities is his phenomenal luck. It makes Miles sort of ganache his teeth. <laughs> <laughs> He's, he's a guy that good things happen to for no particular reason. Um, and Tej uh, kind of being dropped into his lap by uh, Imsec was uh, was one of them. Uh, but yeah, he has to he has to deal with it. Tej is also dealing with her own family problems, uh, which are multiplex and complicated and and all arrive uh, mid book. Um, not giving away too many spoilers. Uh, so it's it's kind of very much about. Family. As a matter of fact, at one point I was sort of stalled in the middle, and I had run uh, some of the material past Tony Weisskopf to you know, say, what, what, "What am I doing here, Tony? What's my motivation in this scene?" And she came back and said, "This seems to be a book about family." And I said, "You know, yeah." Except, what is Ivan's family? I finally figured out that Ivan's family was Impsec symbolically, and a whole lot of things sort of fell out at that point and fell into place. So we actually did have two families involved. So it was an exploration of that, you know, of what, you know, what family does to you and to you and for you and uh, how you balance all these uh, conflicting, uh, conflicting loyalties. Well, um, Captain Vorpatrol's Alliance is, is a really funny book. Um, you know, it's not funny, haha, -ha, but the humor is very organic. Um, but, but I was, you know, sort of being tickled all the way through. Do you chuckle while you write some of these scenes or do you wait till you got it all done? To have a laugh. I, yeah, I pretty much know, you know, um, if it's funny, it's funny to me, you know, going in, and I can hardly wait to get to that scene if I thought of it. I've got three more scenes to write to get to this one. That's going to be hilarious. Uh, uh, so I enjoyed the humor. Um, 
you know, hopefully my readers enjoy it half as much as I do. Uh, and uh, you know, it's kind of, I can tell when the emotions are working because they work for me. I guess for other emotions besides humor as, uh, as well. Uh, you know, if, if I'm kind of teary-eyed, you know, writing down the scene, then I figure that it's going to work for, for most readers as well. So yeah, I kind of have to go by my own sense of humor because what, what else do I have uh, to refer to? Yeah. And it's, uh, it pulls on you know things that I have found funny over time. Uh, one of the climactic scenes in the book is actually based on a scene from an old British comedy that I watched back in the 60s. You know, so stuff goes into the bag and it comes out in all these unexpected ways. One of my favorite uh, comedic moments is it, Ivan ships Miles a, a, that vase, oh, uh, yes. and it's just a piece of junk he picked up. And then, uh, and Ivan and his uh, wife are discussing what to do with it. And it's, I thought that was wonderful because they they don't really know. Why did she I think yeah, Miles know. and his wife are discussing? What should we do with this? Yeah. Ivan sent it to us. It must be important, not necessarily. Yeah. <laughs> That's a, it, it's a the joke gift that people of friends for a long time will send to each other. Yeah. At one point, Miles sent Gregor a lap a lap. I mean, you know, so there's, there's obviously some kind of thing going on here among this group of guys. So you you finally written the Ivan book. Is there mm-hmm. is there any Vorkosigan book that looms on the horizon? Something you've considered for years, or or are you done with the Vorkosiverse? Well, I've been trying to be done with the Vorkosiverse, and it keeps coming back. So I've stopped. Saying I'm done because then I will turn out to be wrong the following year. I thought I'd finished with the civil campaign. I thought I'd finished with the diplomatic community. I thought I'd finished with Cryoburn, and then Ivan's book came up. So I'm not I'm not making predictions. I don't have anything in the pipeline at this time. That's about all I can say uh, about uh, what's to come. Uh, would it be possible we might ever see a another adventure of Young Biles before? I don't know. I find that I write books thematically, that there's a particular set of themes that I want to explore at that particular point in my life, and this has moved through time with me as I have aged. So it would be difficult to go back to that younger frame of mind, you know, 30 years ago. uh, I was a totally different person when I was writing those books. Uh, even your bones replace themselves over a 20-year per- period. So I'm really not the same person who wrote The Warrior's Apprentice or who wrote Shards of Honor. I'm a different person. I need to write different books now. I just haven't quite figured out what they are yet. <laughs> well, the book we're discussing is Captain Vorpatrol's Alliance. It is book 15 or 16, depending on how you count it. In... <laughs> I never uh, never used to count them. The uh, I figured early on, I figured people could figure it out for themselves, and I didn't want to be one of those numbered series. Well, and, it's uh, a book in the Vorkosigan series. Well, you know, so which guess. screws up the numbering system. Uh, and, and also, there's, there's stories, uh, short stories and novellas that fit into the, mm-hmm. the whole Yeah, thing and I might well. pop back and drop something in between somewhere at any time, and then what happens to your numbering system? But the computers insist on it, so we have given up and given them numbers. So, yes. It is 15 or 16, depending on how you count it. In the Vorkoskin saga by Lois McMaster Bujol. It was a New York Times bestseller in hardcover, and it's now out in trade paperback at booksellers everywhere. Lois, thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, you're so welcome. This was fun. Thank you for, for inviting me. Thank you. And now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. This portion of Shadow of Freedom is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com now. If you're not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Okay, here's what has gone before. After a fierce war, Honor Harrington's Star Kingdom of Manticore has reached a truce with a long-standing menace, the ancient aristocratic Solarian League. The Solarian League is crumbling, and on the verge of its empire, rebellion is brewing. The Solarian Office of Frontier Security is in charge of keeping the peace on the verge, often with brutal tactics and support of puppet dictators. Rebels opposed to the oppressive regimes can't hope to match the military might of the OFS without outside aid, and sometimes this is aid they receive in the form of weapon drops 
by agents claiming to represent the star empire of Manticore. These agents actually serve the shadowy Mason alignment, which is a cabal of eugenic supremacists who wish to see the Salarian League and the Star Empire at war. In the Cherubim system, the brother and sister team of Indy and Max Graham have organized a liberation movement to oppose Cherubim's own brand of OFS corruption and oppression. They too have been contacted by covert agents, Mason alignment agents, parading as Star Kingdom operatives, promising them modern weapons and more. Here's part 26 of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. June 1922, Post-Diaspora By this time, even that moron Goldpeak has to realize how badly she fucked up at New Tuscany and Spindle. Their government has to be shitting bricks thinking about the mess she's dragged them all into. If the order relieving her ass and hauling her home hasn't gotten to Spindle yet, it's damned well on its way, Commissioner. Brigadier Francisca Usel, Solarian Gendarmerie, to Sector Governor Lorcan Verrocchio, Office of Frontier Security. Chapter 18 That went more smoothly than I expected, Mackenzie Graham said, standing by the apartment window and gazing out at Cherubim's snow-covered streets. Then she turned away from the window, just in time to catch her brother raising his eyebrows in her direction. Don't look so complacent at me, Indiana Graham. And don't try to pretend you weren't nervous about all these new arrangements, too. Never had a moment's doubt, he told her virtuously. Bullshit, she said tartly, and he chuckled. Well, if you're going to be that way about it, I guess I admit I felt a little bit nervous. A little bit. He raised a thumb and index finger, perhaps a centimeter apart, and grinned at her. Yeah, sure. She shook her head, and the look she gave him was that of a long-suffering sister, not the co-leader of a revolutionary movement. He only grinned even more broadly and unrepentantly, but she had a point. The three tea months since their first meeting with Firebrand might have seemed like plenty of time, but given the slow speed with which ships moved between stars, it really wasn't. In fact, the first shipment of weaponry had arrived over a tea month sooner than they'd expected it could, when the routine notification of waiting cargo containers hit the message account Firebrand had set up, it had come as a total surprise. Fortunately, as Firebrand had suggested, the cargo agents responsible for sneaking those containers into the smuggling queue really didn't want to know anything about their contents. That wasn't how it worked, and if it turned out they contained something with negative consequences, deniability, the ability to say honestly, we didn't know what it was, was actually a fairly acceptable defense in what passed for the Solarian legal system, or at least in what passed for the Solarian legal system where little things like smuggling were concerned. Bruce Graham had been a student of history, and Indiana had become one himself, especially since his father's imprisonment. He wasn't in his dad's league yet, but he also wasn't confined in Terrebor prison, which left him free to pursue his self-education wherever it led, as long as he exercised a modicum of caution. He was pretty sure President McCready and General O'Sullivan had no idea how much subversive knowledge was tucked away in the Seraphim Library's files. Some of it was even in old-fashioned hard-copy books, gathering dust in the physical stacks. And from his reading, Indiana had come to realize there'd actually been periods in human history when the courts would never have tolerated the omnipresent corruption of OFS and its sweetheart deals. Well, they probably had problems of their own even then. On the other hand, I think I'd trade my problems for theirs if I had the option, which I don't. All right, Mackenzie said, shifting from put-upon sibling back to co-conspirator. Now that we've got them, what do we do with them? Now that, Indiana conceded, is a pretty good question, Max. For the moment, the containers were sitting in a warehouse he and Mackenzie were pretty sure was off the Skaggs grid. It was located in the heart of the Rust Belt, 
And while it was in better physical shape than their meeting place with Firebrand, that wasn't saying a lot. But it was mostly weather tight, at least, and the containers themselves were hermetically sealed and virtually indestructible. Of course, getting them there had been a not-so-minor challenge. The Crestor interstellar shipping barcodes, which had ensured their passage through customs without inspection, would have stood out like sore thumbs in the Rust Belt, and so would any of the spaceport's more modern cargo vehicles. But Firebrand's colleagues had anticipated that. The containers were sized to fit inside standard cargo trailers of the sort Seraphim had built for its own use before Crestor and Mendoza of Cordoba arrived to rescue its economy. Even better, they were equipped with built-in countergrav units, so the trailers hadn't ridden suspiciously low on their suspensions. It also made the containers much easier to manhandle with strictly limited manpower once they reached their destination. I'm still not happy about the transport arrangements, Indiana went on. Oh, they worked this time, but we had to put the whole thing together on the fly. Now that we've got them under cover, I want to take a little longer to think before we start moving them around. Works for me, Mackenzie said fervently but then she cocked her head, looking up at her taller brother. It works for me, but at the same time, I don't want to leave them sitting in one big, undigested lump where we could lose all of them in a single disaster if the skags got lucky. Me either. But the more we spread them around in smaller caches, the more likely one of O'Sullivan's informers will stumble across one of them. Or, for that matter, that the recon platforms will spot something. Not if we get them out into the country, Mackenzie argued. I'm thinking about handing them over to Saratoga. Indiana started to reply, then stopped thinking about it. Saratoga was Leonard Silverwitz, a Seraphim Independence Movement area leader. He didn't know he was taking instructions from Indiana and Mackenzie, both of whom he'd known for years, since he'd been a silent partner in the business effort which had led to Bruce Graham's arrest. As far as their SIM roles were concerned, he knew them only as talisman and magpie, and his communications with them were indirect and circuitous. You know, Indiana said slowly, that might not be a bad idea at all. I'm not crazy about putting him at risk this early, but the farm would be a good place to stash them, wouldn't it? The farm, fifty kilometers north of Cherubim, had been a part of Leonard Silverwitz's modest business empire, a commercial farming operation which had employed several dozen people and shown a tidy profit supplying fresh vegetables and dairy products to Seraphim's more urbanized areas. Unfortunately, that very profitability had drawn the attention of Crestor Interstellar's local manager, and the McCready administration had suggested Silverwitz lease the operation to Crestor at about 20% of what it was actually worth. Crestor had then proceeded to fire virtually all of Silverwitz's employees, some of whom had been with him for as much as 20 or 30 T years, and replaced them with automated equipment. Technically, Silverwitz still owned the farm, although he had no control over its operation, and Crestor hadn't been interested in his employees' housing since there were no longer any employees to be housed. Those once sturdy, reasonably comfortable units were slowly decaying into ruin, like most of Seraphim, but they were still there, and Indiana and Mackenzie had planned on using them as a training site when the time came. They were far enough out to be beyond the Skag's normal zone of interest, and there was enough traffic transporting the farm's produce to the city and the necessary supplies back to its fields to cover quite a lot of movement on the SIM's part. I think it would be a good place, or I wouldn't have suggested it, Mackenzie pointed out. At the same time, there's always the chance some service tech out there to work on a broken-down cultivator or harvester might spot something. That was always going to be the case when we started training out there anyway, Indiana replied. And these containers are a lot sturdier and more weathertight than I expected, so he could hide them out in the woods instead of one of the barns where your service tech might be poking around. 
or someplace even better than that. He smiled at her, and she frowned back for a couple of seconds. Then her expression cleared. You're thinking of Culver Hill, aren't you? That's exactly what I'm thinking about, Indiana nodded. He and his sister had spent a lot of childhood summer nights camping out by the small lake just east of Culver Hill, which was how they happened to know about the cave system that ran for kilometers under the hill itself. The caves were on the damp side, but with the container's hermetic seals... That's not a bad idea at all, Mackenzie said approvingly. Then she grinned. How did you happen to have it? Very funny, Indiana scowled at her. But since I seem to be doing the intellectual heavy lifting today, I hereby nominate you to figure out exactly how we're going to get them to the farm in the first place. Well, the first stage is to let Saratoga know they're coming, Mackenzie pointed out. We're going to need him to take a look at the caves and be sure he can get them in. Even with the countergrav, moving them's going to be a pain, especially without a lot of warm bodies to help, and there are some pretty narrow spots just inside the cave's entrance. Agreed. But let's not tell him what we're planning to send him. Indiana's expression was considerably more serious than it had been. There's no point telling him the guns have arrived if it turns out he can't handle them. Mackenzie nodded soberly. One of their guiding principles was that what someone didn't know, someone couldn't spill accidentally, or under the sort of duress Tillman O'Sullivan's skags were expert at applying. All right. Indiana gave a brisk nod of his own. I'll put the message together and get it into the secure drop for Osiris. Osiris was Janice Karpov, Indiana and Mackenzie's contact with Silverwitz. If I get my butt in motion, I can probably make the drop this evening still. Just don't take any stupid chances, Indy, Mackenzie said a bit sharply. He looked at her, and she scowled again, more darkly than before. You've always just had to run right out and start playing with your toys ever since you were a kid, and some things really don't change, do they? I swear, I've known five-year-olds with more patience than you have. Well, discretion, anyway. She snorted. Those weapons aren't going to get all old and worn out sitting there for an extra day or two. I knew they aren't, Max. Indiana's tone was more soothing than agreeing, but Mackenzie was willing to settle for that. Getting him to admit she had a point would probably have been expecting too much, but that wasn't the same thing as his not knowing she had one. If I can make the drop without pushing too hard, I'd still prefer to get it done tonight he continued. All the same, we didn't set up secure communications routes just so I could blow things when a really important message comes along, did we? That wasn't why I thought we were doing it, no, she agreed. Point taken, he capitulated. Then he grinned. You know, I know all about secure communications and how important they are, but still, I'd really love to see Uncle Leonard's face when he finds out he's about to receive an entire battalion's worth of small arms and support weapons. Chapter 19 Haven't heard anything new out of Gold Peak or Medusa, anyway, Captain Sadako Merriman said, looking up from the notes on her mini-comps display. That doesn't mean they aren't up to something, of course, Commissioner, she grimaced. The truth is, we're pretty sure they are up to something. We just don't have a clue what. The slender, fine-boned frontier fleet officer wasn't one of Lorcan Verrocchio's favorite people for several reasons. Among other things, she had an annoying habit of seeming unimpressed by his own august presence, but she also had an equally annoying habit of telling him the truth. He supposed that counted for something, even if don't have a clue wasn't exactly what he wanted to hear out of his senior naval intelligence specialist. We're trying to get better information, of course, Commissioner. Commodore Francis Thurgood, who had the distinction of being someone Verrocchio liked even less than Merriman, put in. 
In the wake of what happened to Admiral Crandall, though, we're not in a position to push as hard for it as I'm sure we'd all like to. I don't think the Mantis would be very receptive to any port visits on our part, for example. I'm aware of that, thank you, Commodore, Barocchio said as pleasantly as he could. The stocky Commodore had a weathered-looking appearance, which Verrocchio found strange in someone who spent his entire working life in artificial environments. And although Thurgood was reasonably careful to avoid emphasizing it, he'd also tried to warn Sandra Crandall about what she was walking into. Of course, even his gloomy projections had fallen well short of the reality. They'd just been closer than anyone else's. The Manticoran's decision to recall their merchant shipping from Solarian space isn't helping, Governor, Merriman added. I realize we didn't have much of their shipping here in Sector to begin with, but there was always at least some cross-pollination, let's say. Merchant spacers talk to each other wherever their paths happen to cross. They always seem to know a lot more than you think they should about what's going on, and you can usually pick up a lot listening to them. In this case, though, there's no one to do the talking. Verrocchio nodded, not that he needed reminders about how painfully the Mantis had wounded the League's interstellar commerce. He'd managed to sidestep any responsibility for Sandra Crandall's decision to attack Spindle, but its disastrous consequences had created enough crap to splash everyone in the sector, especially its commissioner. Official news of the Manti Murchie's recall had reached Myers less than two weeks earlier, and the ruinous consequences of the withdrawal of Manticoran vessels from the League's shipping lanes had been none too gently pointed out to him by higher authority. Some of those higher authorities hadn't been shy about suggesting that it was the direct result of events in his sector, either. With all due respect, Commissioner, it's also possible we are not hearing anything because there's nothing to hear about. Brigadier Francisca Usel put in. The Madras Sector's senior gendarmerie officer had blonde hair, gray eyes, and the short, square muscularity of a heavy worlder. She also had an unhappy expression, and Verrocchio scowled mentally as he looked at her. She'd never liked Thorgood, whom she referred to as that old woman, or Merriman, whom she regarded as an interloper into internal security matters which were none of her affair, and she disagreed strenuously with their analysis of the Manticoran's probable intentions. She was also a bigger pain in his posterior than Merriman and Thorgood combined, but that didn't necessarily mean she was wrong. I realize you have a different perspective from the Navy's, Francisca, the commissioner said. But it's Commodore Thurgood's and Captain Merriman's responsibility to look at the worst case from a naval perspective. I agree. Usel didn't try very hard to sound as if she meant it, Verrocchio observed. I'm simply saying we shouldn't scare ourselves into hiding in a corner on the basis of what happened at Spindle. By this time, even that moron Goldpeak has to realize how badly she fucked up at New Tuscany and Spindle. Their government has to be shitting bricks thinking about the mess she's dragged them all into. If the order relieving her ass and hauling her home hasn't gotten to Spindle yet, it's damned well on its way, Commissioner. Verrocchio nodded in acknowledgment although he was a far cry from agreeing with her. Nothing he'd seen out of the Mantis suggested any inclination on their part to give ground, and he very much doubted Elizabeth Winton was going to recall her cousin from Talbot any time soon. He did have to agree with at least one of Usel's underlying premises, that no one except a maniac would willingly contemplate an all-out war with the Solarian League, no matter how good his weapons technology was. Unfortunately, Every indication he'd seen said the Mantis were maniacs. That was why he rejected her opposition of anything that smacked of appeasement. It was her view that giving ground to Manticore would only increase the Star Empire's arrogance and ambition, whereas refusing to be bullied and panicked into giving it whatever it wanted would cause it to pull in its horns. She might actually be right about that. In fact, he hoped she was. But after the string of disasters which had landed on his doorstep, he had no intention of being the one who refused to be bullied and found out the Mantis weren't bluffing after all. 
It's possible Brigadier Usel is right about that, Commissioner, Thorgood said, without, Verrocchio noticed, sounding any more sincere than Usel had. For the moment, however, Gold Peak's still in command, according to our most recent information, at any rate, and I think we can safely assume she's going to at least redeploy her forces. She may be more confrontational than her government would like, but in a tactical sense, at least, she's demonstrated she's nobody's fool. And as she demonstrated, for better or worse, at New Tuscany, she's not afraid to act on her own authority either. He smiled thinly. He'd tried to warn Joseph Bing, too. I anticipate encountering a heavier Manti naval presence along our frontier very soon now. I'll agree that I don't think she's going to push any confrontations with the League if she can help it, but she's not going to be backing down either. Are you suggesting she's likely to begin offensive operations into the Madras sector, Commodore? Vice Commissioner Junyan Hongbo asked. To be honest, Mr. Vice Commissioner, I don't see any reason she should, if not for exactly the same reasons as Brigadier Usel. The truth is, though, that it's not like we've got the firepower to threaten the Talbot Quadrant. I'm sorry, the Talbot Sector. The Commodore grimaced slightly as he corrected himself. Obviously, he found Frontier Security's continued insistence that the Talbot Quadrant's incorporation into the Star Empire of Manticore was legally suspect more than a bit silly. I don't see Manticore wanting to push any sort of conquest in our direction for a lot of reasons, including the desire, as the Brigadiers suggested, to keep some kind of lid on this whole confrontation. I don't expect her to back off if push comes to shove, but I also don't see her going looking for unnecessary fights or dissipating her resources against anything she doesn't consider is a genuine, immediate, and pressing threat. So, since we don't have any naval bases that could threaten them, I'd expect her to look elsewhere in an operational sense. Frankly, little though I'm sure any of us would like to admit it, we're just not important enough for her to be worrying about at the moment. Oh, thank you, Commodore, Verrocchio thought sourly. Not important enough to worry about. Doesn't that just underscore the hit Frontier Security's prestige is already taken? That thought wouldn't have bothered him so much if he hadn't suspected Thurgood took a certain satisfaction in pointing it out. The Commodore would have been more than human if he hadn't felt gratified, or justified at least, at having been right when everyone else, especially Sandra Crandall, had all but accused him of cowardice for warning them the Mantis might just conceivably be serious when they said they were. So your recommendation would be that we should basically stay home and avoid provoking her, Hongbo said, and Thurgood shrugged. I wouldn't put it quite that way myself, Mr. Vice Commissioner. We don't have the capability to provoke her. What I'm saying is that unless we're significantly reinforced, about the best we can realistically expect to do is to police our own merchant traffic, such as it is and what there is of it, and provide reaction forces if any of the sector's planets should get restive, Obviously, that constitutes staying home, but that's another way of saying it constitutes doing our job, too. He regarded Hongbo levelly across the conference table. If anyone wants us to do something more proactive, they're damned well going to have to send us the means to do it. And given the weapons capability the Mantis have demonstrated, I don't know that anyone has the means to send. Hongbo looked back at him for a moment, then nodded. Point taken, Commodore, he said in an almost conciliatory tone. I didn't mean to sound as if I were suggesting you intended to shirk your responsibilities. I guess I'm just not any more immune to frustration and, well, nervousness than anyone else. 
Thurgood's fleeting smile acknowledged the vice commissioner's semi-apology, and Merriman cleared her throat. At any rate, commissioner, she said to Verrocchio, I'm afraid that really does constitute all the Navy can contribute to the intelligence picture at this point. I wish we could tell you more, but we can't. That was David Weber's Shadow of Freedom, Part 26, read by Allison Johnson. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com. Thanks to Hank Davis, Laura Haywood, Corey, Christopher Chifani, and podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. A giant champagne bottle filled with food vomiting butterbugs and planet spanning streamers of gratitude and thanks to Lois McMaster Bujol, author of Captain Vorpatrel's Alliance. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars. <laughs>